Hello and welcome to Healing Tips from the Heart, Intuition with Helpers, Healers, and Guides. I am your host, Dr. Lori Hopps, licensed psychologist, writer, and artist. I've explored mind, body, and spirit related to intuition, or your personal guidance system, since early childhood. Meet my guests who have learned from their personal and professional lives to explore vast realms of knowing, synchronicities, and overcoming challenges. Their stories may inspire you with tools to enhance your daily living and relationships. Hello and welcome, my special guest, Dr. Larry Burke. Dr. Burke is a medical doctor who did his training and residency at the University of Pittsburgh. He's also trained in acupuncture, hypnosis, and is a certified energy health practitioner. He was a co-founder of the Duke Integrative Medicine Program and has a coaching practice online at Healing Imager, LLC specializing in EFT or emotional freedom technique, hypnosis, dream work, and the Enneagram. Dr. Burke retired from Duke University Medical Center in 2021 after a 40-year career as a holistic musculoskeletal radiologist, which he'll be talking a little bit more about, a very unique position in the world. He has published two books, one of them in 2012 called Let Magic Happen, Adventures in Healing with a Holistic Radiologist, and also in 2018, the book Dreams That Can Save Your Life, Early Warning Signs of Cancer and Other Diseases, which we will be talking about shortly. So welcome, welcome, my special guest, Dr. Larry. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's great to be with you, Lori. And I just was going to mention that uh, many people think that a holistic radiologist is an oxymoron. So, okay, uh, can you explain uh, that a little bit for people uh, who don't know? Uh, most people have a a, a pretty uh, conventional view of what a radiologist does, and it, it seems pretty linear and 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 not very holistic. So there are about fifteen of us around the country who are, are connected, and about. Uh, third of us have written books and uh you know uh, for me it sort of focuses on started with uh, learning hypnosis for my claustrophobic patients uh, okay. because the other other alternative was to give them uh, iv valium and that would work but sometimes they would quit breathing when they're in the mri scanner so that wasn't a good idea and so that that was my sort of doorway into alternative medicine through hypnosis so you had patients who needed to be in this enclosed space for the purposes of taking the the assessments, and they were completely freaked out. And so you decided to learn hypnosis to help calm them down. And did you find that successful? It was great. And at the time, I didn't know emotional freedom techniques yet, or I would have combined EFT with the hypnosis. But the hypnosis worked pretty well. And you just asked people to imagine where they'd rather be than uh, in that tight, confining MRI scanner. And they usually say, I want to go to the beach or the mountains. And you just say, just go there for the next hour and we'll tell you when to come back. Yeah. Yeah. And so why did you move to EFT? Um, Well, I had learned acupuncture also. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, My uh, acupuncture training was in 1998 and my uh, hypnosis training was um, back in uh, 1990. But when I got to 2002, uh, I met, uh, I was education director for Duke Integrated Medicine and we had a big national conferences and Cheryl Richardson was one of the keynoters. And she heard I was doing acupuncture and hypnosis and was interested in emotional uh, processes. And she's, oh, how come you're not doing EFT? And I had never heard of it. So that was, that, so they introduced me to it. And she said, go download Gary Craig's manual and uh, you can start doing it the next day. And, and sure enough, I did. So. Wow. And, and you stuck with that because you found it easier or better? Did people like it better? Yeah, it was, uh, well, first of all, uh, I got tired of sticking needles in people. I did enough of that as a radiologist. And uh, and plus, it was a self-care technique that people could, could use on their own. And um, it was mm-hmm. found it to be very empowering, just like self-hypnosis. And it's actually a great combination of acupuncture and, and hypnosis because 
Uh, you've, but you've changed the language to make it negative language that you're uh, attempting to delete these malware programs out of your body and then reinstall a new program with the hypnosis. So. Yeah. And it works. It works. Yeah. Oh, and when I started, there was one randomized controlled trial. Oh <laughs> and, and and that was at Duke, that was very important. And and yeah. I said, this is evidence, sort of evidence-based medicine. There's, there's one say now there's dozens, if not uh, over a hundred, you know, so. Yeah. Well, a randomized control, not so much. There aren't hundreds, but well over 200 in general. Yeah. And many dozen randomized control. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And uh, for specific areas. Yeah. Wow. So you were, you've been around since almost the inception. I mean, it started really with Roger Callahan in the seventies, but when it started to become more popularized in a very small community, that's when you jumped in. So wonderful. How lucky for you and your patients that they could have a more relaxing experience with you and you didn't have to poke them with more needles. Yeah. And my very first, as soon as I downloaded that manual, I was teaching a stress management class for, for Duke undergrads at the time. And I, I walked in the class, I, I shared the information with them. I said, oh, this is an interesting new technique. We're doing a potpourri of all the different mind-body approaches. Mm -hmm. And after class, a student comes up and says, I think I, I need uh, that technique. And I said, what do you mean? Well, I've got hives all over my body. Uh, and ever since a car accident uh, two weeks ago, and... They put me on Benadryl at Student Health, which made me drowsy. The hives went away, but I couldn't study. And then we went off the Benadryl. Hives came back, still couldn't study. What am I going to do? And, and I said, well, um, I, just, I just learned this off the internet. I'm sure, I'm sure this will work. And then she goes, and she goes I got to get to my next class in 25 minutes. Uh, how long will it take? I said, oh, I, I used some hypnosis. It won't take too long. you know. And then yeah. uh, we did the, just, I was just reading the basic recipe sheet and Tapped down one side, and it was scary. Thought I was going to die a car accident, and it was an eight out of ten uh, side score. And so she tapped on that one side, tapped on the other side, and went down from from an eight to a to a four. And I thought I, I didn't know it was going to work at all, and it, was, it seems to be working. So I read that she, if there's another aspect of it, uh, you, you can shift it. And it was like, okay, uh, what's worse than almost dying in, in, a, in a car accident? She she spun around on the Jersey Turnpike and and hit. The airbags went off and all that. And, and and she goes, oh, I totaled my dad's car. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. Well, what's the score on that one? She goes, oh, that's an 11, you know, so. <laughs> off so, the charts. So we tapped on guilty about my dad's car, guilty about my dad's car. And uh, two more minutes and it went down to a two. And I said, whoa. And, and so I gave her the, the basic recipe sheet and said, just don't take any more medication. Just tap whenever you need to. And class was two days later. She came back beaming going, no more hives, uh, and no more meds. And I tapped every time I felt itchy, I did a little more tapping. Yeah. And then she goes, I tapped on all my other car accidents. And I was like, whoa. I, I it was like the inner healer just told her this was working. So keep doing it. And I didn't have any idea she had other car accidents. She regained her confidence in driving and thought, thought that was the hi whole, highlight of the whole semester. And that was my, my entree. When, when you have a case like that, the first time it kind of breaks things open. And then I wound up publishing a paper in uh, a few years later on EFT for uh, PTSD after car accidents. And, and they were all just one session and yeah. that got published in the Energy Psychology Journal. So that was my contribution to the EFT literature. So. Fantastic. What a great story. Don't you love it? How when you like fall into something new for the first time, you get this wow experience and not all EFT stories are as dramatic or a success. Well, that was a one minute wonder, you know, and it's yes. like, oh my God. You know, so. Yeah, it doesn't always work like that, but how great, because then it gets you interested to follow it. It's almost like, um, you know, the muse is at your back saying more, do more, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. so you stuck with that for a while. And then when did the dream work start to come in? Well, it's interesting. My backstory in that is I started keeping a dream, a dream journal in uh, 1987. So okay. I've been I've been keeping my own journal for for many years, and I've had many precognitive dreams and, and insights into my own health conditions, and even dreams about other people's health problems. Okay. Uh, but it wasn't till about 2006, I think it was, when one of my best friends. Oh, actually, I take that back. One of my um, colleague teaching colleagues at, at at Duke in 2000 uh, was this very intuitive woman named Polly Delavitt, and and she. Uh, had this amazing story about how she diagnosed her cancer of the tongue uh, by dreams of spiders coming out of her mouth. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
and and that was my first uh, experience of someone talking about diagnosing their own illness with a dream. And so she, um, she got me inspired by that. But then in 2006, one of my other best friends um, told me the story about her breast cancer. And that was started that whole process and that she was had a very incredibly vivid dream. And she was 50 ish, and uh, no symptoms, you know, uh, n n hadn't had any recent imaging studies. And so she has a dream that she's on the operating room table with a woman surgeon operating on her left breast. And it was like, Okay, that was, you know, very detailed, and and she knew what she had to do, and she went into the radiology department uh, that week, and she said, "I need a mammogram," and they did the mammogram. She had relatively dense breasts, mm -hmm. uh, which makes it hard to find cancer, and <laughs> came back. No radiologist came out, reassured her, said, "You can come back in six months. Uh, nothing there." She said, "No, I'm not. I th I still still think I have cancer," and and she didn't tell her why, uh, but. Uh, she said, I'm not leaving till you do an ultrasound. She goes, well, we don't just do an ultrasound when we don't know, you know, what, what we're looking for. And uh, she said, just do it right here. And she points to the breast. And the radiologist kind of rolls her eyes and she puts the probe on it. And there's that one centimeter cancer deep in the breast. And and the radiologist was like completely freaked out. And she said, how'd you know it was there? She said, I had it. That's when she said she had a dream about it. And then okay. and then a week, week later, she goes to see the uh, uh, surgeon for her preoperative visit. And it's the woman... Who was in the dream and that was oh well, ooh, chills exactly and, and that got me started then i had a few other friends uh, with breast cancer and uh, and, and dreams and then i decided to do a survey uh, to find out. I, I joined the international association for the study of dreams and did a survey uh, of inter international uh, people around the world i went up with 18 women uh, who had the same story and so I wound up um, getting that published in the Explorer Journal, just a survey talking about you know what it was like for women to have these dreams, and it was like the, the dreams were more more vivid than anything they've ever had before. They often had a, a, a sense of touch, like their hand was pointing, or a guide was in the dream pointing in in, in the breast, and sometimes they had. Uh, Healthcare professionals in white coats show up as a guide, or or a deceased family member, like a mother mm -hmm. who had breast cancer or something like that. And mm -hmm. and those are some of the characteristics. And there's also a sense of dread that I need to do something about this now. And and then after that, I I gave a TED TEDx talk about about that, and that got banned. Um, if you're outside the TED box, you'll get censored, and that was my first experience of censorship. Yeah. Uh, and then I wrote a book about it with one of the uh, dreamers from uh, my study, Kat O'Keefe Cannabis, and she had amazing stories about her, her guide was a Franciscan monk who came and told her, waving a, a feather, this is going to be your, your, your weapon to, to get the doctor's attention, and she didn't even have, uh, they couldn't find it on the imaging studies, and, and, and so she wound up finding a doctor who would operate on her without having the study, and sure enough, she had the cancer, and she's Wow. Alive and well, alive and well. Fifteen years later, and, and like an Energizer Bunny now, writing more and more books. And uh, so we wrote that book together, and that was, and we wound up collecting cases from around the world of other types of uh, cancers and a few other diseases as well. But the most interesting one that, uh, that was in the popular uh, press was the famous actor Mark Ruffalo. You know, he plays mm -hmm. the, the Incredible Hulk, um, and in many other movies. Well, apparently, right at the beginning of his movie career, like 20 plus years ago, he had a dream about having a brain tumor. Hmm. And so, what are you going to do with a dream like that? He comes into the to the movie set that he's working on and finds the Hollywood doctor and says, "I, I think I have a brain tumor." And you know, I'm sure this doctor's used to dealing with wacko uh, act, actors all the time. He's, <laughs> so he said, "All right, we'll get a CAT scan to make you know reassure you." And and it turns out he's got a, a golf ball sized uh, you know cancer uh, right behind his ear. Uh, in, in, next to his brainstem, and that mm -hmm. was an acoustic neuroma, which is a benign tumor, but it's it's not benign in its location because it, it will cause pressure on your brain and on your cranial nerves, and and you know, and now the, the really puzzling thing was they did a uh, auditory test on him to see if he had any hearing loss because it's a, a a tumor of the nerve that, that responsible for healing, and they only for found hearing. a twenty. Yeah, they only found a 20% reduction in his hearing on that side, uh -huh. which meant he could have gone on for 
months, if not years, before it was ever ever diagnosed. Yeah. And there's a, another significant problem with the surgery for that is the facial nerve runs right by the auditory nerve. It's the seventh and eighth nerves. And, uh, and, and if, if, if that nerve gets impacted by the surgery, uh, you wind up having facial paralysis, like a, a permanent Bell's palsy. Uh-huh. And so that was, he, he knew he was going to lose his hearing when they took the, ner- the nerve out with the tumor, but he was hoping he could get away without you know, the facial nerve damage. And so he woke up in the in the uh, uh, in the oh, in the post op recovery room, and his face was doing fine. I mean, he couldn't hear obviously out of that ear. But then, as he's getting discharged to leave, his whole face droops, and he loses the function in, in that nerve. And he spent the next nine months doing acupuncture. And then one day, his eye started to move, and his whole face came back, and his career was saved. So if he'd uh, been delayed another months or years before the tumor got even bigger that, that probably wouldn't have come back so what a story my goodness i'm just captivated listening to you i've had the pleasure of hearing you speak several times you're such an amazing teacher and and these stories are so dramatic and powerful and they just take you right in and i'm wondering if you wouldn't mind reflecting a little bit on wh- what you've learned from being at the cusp of these incredible stories that have come to you. Yeah, I, I think that um, my first book, I, I wrote a lot about uh, symbolic symptoms in the body, you know, like mm-hmm. uh, essentially being a somatic metaphor for some emotional issue that's unresolved and, and stuck in your body, like a malware program, like we were describing mm-hmm. before. Yeah. And then when I started getting the dream work, I realized, okay, um, and Edgar Casey and uh, other people who, who talked about dreams um, centuries ago uh, would say that nothing, Casey specifically said, nothing important happens to you that isn't foreshadowed in your dreams. So, and, and unfortunately, the art of dream interpretation and even keeping a dream diary has been lost. And when I when I give I gave a, an EFT lecture to a workshop to, to a bunch of mental health professionals, <laughs> and I was sharing these stories. I said, "So how many of you keep a dream diary?" Like ten percent of a group oh, of kidding. like a therapist. I was shocked, and I was like, "Oh my god!" So okay, so that means that the number of your patients who are actually keeping a dream diary is even lower. And 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 I said, "What about Jung and Freud?" Didn't, oh, we had a week on them, and then then we never heard about it again. And I was like, <laughs> Okay, he must be younger than me. <laughs> oh, and and, uh, and and you know Freud, the ro- dreams of the royal road to the unconscious, and, yeah. and it's the cheapest therapy you can get, and yeah. and you know, and so so I just started encouraging all my clients to keep a, a dream journal because I realized you know, if you're fortunate, you can get the message from your body ahead of time through a dream, and it doesn't have to manifest as a physical symptom. Yeah. Um. So. And, and if you don't get the, the more subtle message, you're going to get a stronger message from, from your body in terms of symptoms. But they, you can kind of work with both the symptoms and the dream symbols essentially the same way. It's like, what does the dream want? What does your symptom want? And and the, and the symptoms are sacred messengers from your subconscious, and you better right. better treat them that way. And then I also get people who uh, you know contact me and say, I had this dream. It seems to be a, a physical illness type dream. And I always say, you got to ask two questions. One is, um, is this a dream about me or, or someone close to me? Because mm. uh, that's critical to, to establish that. And then if, if, it's, if it's about you, then you ask the next question is, is it an emotional metaphor mm-hmm. or is it a physical thing I, I need to take care of now? Or both. Uh, yeah, or both. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it often there's there's going to be an emotional metaphor, but sometimes it's only an emotional metaphor and there's nothing physical. And, yeah. and, and that's um, an important distinction to make. Uh, and, and I've had two instances uh, where that came up. When I was presenting at the ISD um, uh, dream conference, one of the researchers came and said, I had a client who had a dream about having a um, cancer in her groin. Hmm. And you know, she went through every imaging study, looking, searching for the CT scan, MRI scan, ultrasound, everything. Nothing came up. And she finally had the insight that, like, hmm, okay, my my boyfriend um, is a astrological cancer sign, and he's 
behaving kind of malignant, malignantly. Oh. So she dumped them. Now, then you might say, well, what if she had ignored that dream and married the guy? Would she have then gotten a cancer there? You know, uh, we don't know. Uh, right. And then, and then my other, my close friend and one of my MRI techs, uh, Ann Charles, who's in my TED talk, she, she said, oh, I had this dream about giving birth at age 58. It was like, and she said, that made no sense. It's like, mm -hmm. uh, I've been postmenopausal for years and, and, she, and she's a, um, an artist, a rug hooker. And she assumed, oh, I'm just, it's about giving birth to my next project. But yeah. she's a very, very skilled dreamer. And she immediately asked for a uh, clarifying dream, which is an important uh, thing to know about. And she said, tell me more about that uh, giving birth dream because I can't figure it out. And mm -hmm. so the next night she gets this, taken to this uh, cemetery in Ireland and shown a headstone with her name on it and then surrounded by daisies and she says if you don't uh, do something about that dream last night you'll be pushing up these daisies soon and it was like okay so she went right to the gynecologist and and she was somewhat overweight so she couldn't really feel anything on the physical exam they did a um a, an ultrasound and she had an endometrial cancer in her uterus oh. and then the punchline is you have two choices on how to operate on that it can be an abdominal hysterectomy where they do it in midline incision or it can be a vaginal hysterectomy where they deliver it through the vagina essentially yeah. giving birth to the tumor and that, that's oh. what she did so uh, that was an amazing uh, th th so those two stories always stick with me in terms of getting clarification yeah know. wow the beautiful metaphors they're so powerful and they're so personal I mean, you're highlighting a lot of what I teach when I teach um, developing or embodied intuition classes, yeah, all great. these features of like metaphor and importance and that it's singular to you and that it's usually delivered with an intensity, but not a fear and um, and that you need to pay attention and, and do some digging sometimes to figure out what does this mean? It doesn't come crystal clear. So even in the clarifying dream, the importance of it it didn't say you have an endometrial tumor, you know, in your uterus that you're going to deliver vaginally like a baby, yeah. you know, so it, it's, it's gets confusing and, and you have to really dig inside and, and be curious and how many people um, either don't remember their dreams are frightened of their dreams or forget about them or brush them off. Oh, it was just a dream is what we're told growing up um, in many cultures. Yeah. And I have clients who, swear they never remember their dreams and i say when i do my original uh, initial free like phone call and, and say look you know before your first appointment with me uh you'll probably have a, a dream of some sort and yeah. so planting that suggestion and i say sometimes it's just a dream fragment like a, a picture or one sentence and then afterwards sometimes i'll have an epic dream which tells me exactly what's what's going on and also setting the intention by by buying a dream diary keeping it by your bed and, and I always ask a question before you go to bed to, to sort of prime the dream world to let them know you're open for business. Yeah. And, and the only rule is you can only ask one question a night because you want to know what the dream is responding to. So okay. and that's great advice. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Have you had any dreams you care to share that maybe changed your life or were? Oh, yeah, not many. But um, something that you feel comfortable sharing. Yeah. One of the most interesting ones um, since. A lot of the, the healing work we do you know, sort of is a metaphor for the healing journey, hero's mm -hmm. journey. So uh, I had left uh, Duke in 2004 out and, and to do read MRI scans from home. And I, that was a great gig to have when I, my kids were teenagers and I could go to all their events and everything. And, and then in 2015, I got invited to come back. Uh, they were short staffed. They needed me to come back part time. So uh, I was debating whether this is a good thing to do or not. And I had this dream and I had been a, a Duke uh, undergrad for, for college. And I am, I am in this dream. I am uh, in a English class with my favorite grad student, English instructor uh, who I took two classes from uh, one was images of God, and modern fiction. And the other was the absurd and modern literature. And those stand out as highlights out of my, my whole pre-med curriculum, you know? And so she shows up in the dream and says, this is going to be a class in creative writing. And, I, and I, that would have been, that would have terrified me back in, in college. And, and I said, I don't think I signed up for that. And, and so then I, I go out the door and down a winding path. Uh, and and it feels like the start of a hero's journey. I get to the bottom of, of, of the trail and there's a old 
woman crone there uh, with a roadside stand selling magic elixirs. Oh. So I think I got to buy one of these so it's dark fluid. I drink the fluid down, and as I drink it down, it reveals writing on the back, back of the flask. And it says, that elevator over there, go over there, uh, push the down button, and go to, go to the bottom. So I, I do as instructed, get out the bottom of the elevator, and it's like I'm going out on the yellow brick road in the Wizard of Oz, and it's off to see the wizard, and I'm, and I'm back back to Duke, you know. So, so that, was, uh, that was a guiding dream at that point. And then um, uh, and, and I didn't really know exactly why I was going back to Duke because, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, by the time I finished there, I'd read 60,000 MRI scans. So I didn't think I needed to read more MRI scans. But what, what happened was one of the, uh, my friends who's also a holistic radiologist in the mammography uh, section, she and I got together and we did another uh, survey of uh, patients who are going for breast biopsies about their dreams. Okay. And because we wanted to get, gather more data and see how significant it was. Now, it turned out that, that um, you know, very few of the 163 women uh, kept a dream diary, like two or three. Mm -hmm. And only, only uh, you know, uh, like 5% of them said that they, they had a dream related to their, uh, their breast. So it was, you know, considering we had 18 people, but that was all around the world, a self-selected population. This yeah. was, you know, uh, just a survey. And, but, but one woman stuck out and she said, my, my, uh, my daughter came and told me to, to go get a mammogram. And, and okay. I said, uh, your daughter, she, she died when she was a teenager from a, a, a malignancy. And so, oh. and, and she specifically told this woman to go get a mammogram. It's like, okay, that was a cool story. After the daughter had passed, she came in a dream state. Oh. Uh, decades later decades yeah. later so it was a warning warning yeah. message yeah yeah from her beloved wow yeah it, i'm reflecting on my own dream i don't keep an active dream journal but i do i have over the years and i'm very aware of my dreams um and i do a lot of writing um and sometimes things are precognitive sometimes they're message in layers and they come true decades later. Uh, yeah, that's true too. You, you don't know. I mean, I've had precognitive ones. That, I, I had a whole, you'll, you'll get a kick out of this. I had uh, about three or four tornado dreams back in 1996. Um, okay. And, and the, after every one, there was a tornado in North Carolina the next day. And we're pretty rare for North, for North Carolina tornado. So, mm -hmm. and, and that got me, I was just so blown away by the pig tide of nature. And even one was a trip to Florida I was on. I had a dream about tornado hitting the North Carolina uh, Raleigh Durham airport. Mm -hmm. And the next day I was flying home and the plane had to be rerouted because the tornado tore the top off the hangar, you know? Wow. And, and so, so I would, but that was then 20 years later, I was doing a dream workshop with some, someone and some uh, um, leader was saying, well, you know, tornado dreams often um, are metaphors for your whole life being turned upside yeah. down. And, and then I realized, oh, 1996 was when I made the decision to leave full-time radiology and go into um, integrated medicine. Mm -hmm. And my whole career did get turned upside down. Yeah. But I was so enamored with the precognitive nature of it. I didn't even think about any symbolism of the tornado at all. Of course. Of course. Not, not till 20 years later when I go, oh, oh man, I missed that completely. Well, you didn't miss it, but yeah, there it is. And and how fun to rediscover it. And you were also more into um, the multi-layer of consciousness by then. So you were ready to see that aspect of it. But, you know, around the world forever, dreams have been recorded, interpreted, um, seen as prophecy, um, you know, um, help people uh, uh, make choices, wise choices, understand about weather and migrational shifts and all kinds of things, um, historical changes, um, genocide, all kinds of things yeah. come up in dreams. And we do, I think we do need to pay more attention to it. Um, and so yeah. I thank you so much for your contribution to this literature and, yeah. and fascinating discoveries of what's possible. And I was going to mention for any women out there who are having breast cancer dreams, it's important to realize that of the 18 women uh, who were in my study, I think all of them are still alive and all of them mm -hmm. use their dreams for continued healing, not just diagnosis. So that's okay. important. And there's one, just one cool story to, to, to leave you with is this woman, 
woman from the book who at age 29, I think she had stage four uterine cancer mm. and, and seriously uh, in trouble. She had she was a young mother um, and she was praying and, 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 and the oncologist said, we can give you the chemo, but uh, you still have like a 5% chance of, of surviving. Mm. And, and then, so she has a dream uh, where an alien spaceship landed in her backyard, comes mm. in, in, into the uh, house. Uh, the little green man gives her a, a syringe with green fluid and says, you need some interferon. And interferon was an experimental drug at the time that, that she'd never heard of. Yeah. So she, she goes into the doctor and, and, and tells him, can I get some interferon? He's like, how do you know about interferon? Oh, I dreamed about it last night. And he, he says, <laughs> okay, well, we'll get you some. And sure enough, she went into remission and, and you know, that was 20 years ago. So uh, wow. that's one of my favorite healing dreams, but there, there are many other ones like that. So. Yes. And so you've mentioned, you know, we haven't stated it, but you've mentioned the helpers, healers, and guides. So the deceased daughter, the little green man, the um, the friends, the uh, spiritual guides, the, you know, um, whispers that come um and um and maybe even divine beings of light masters yeah yeah they're here to help us yep and uh, and i also tell tell my clients the weirder the dream the better it's like if, if you're getting some really outside the box so far out stuff that's what you want to write down and i also tell them look no, i don't consider anything a nightmare it's like it's just that way to get your attention and a nightmare means you need to make a course correction. A, a, a wonderful healing dream means you're on the right track. So it's like mm -hmm. either way, they're important. So. Yeah. Lessons and blessings, I often say. Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, this is so wonderful. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we say goodbye for today? Um, yeah, just keep a dream diary. It's so simple. And, and once you get in the habit of it, uh, you know, it, it just becomes a natural process and you might remember more than one dream a night and also always write them down as soon as you have them. Don't think, oh, remember that, that was so cool. I'll remember it in the morning. Yeah, yeah uh, you got to get it down on paper. And, and the other, other key thing is you don't really want to turn a white light on to write with. Okay. So I recommend getting some kind of red light, which does not suppress your pineal function. And okay. it can be just, you know, I use my LED alarm clock, which is red. Uh, mm -hmm. You can order some pens off Amazon that, that, that have red uh, lights in them. And, uh, and that's, I used to try to write in the dark and then I get up in the morning, I wrote, wrote, wrote over the same line for five times. I couldn't yeah, read yeah, it. You can't no, read it. it's not going to work. Uh, I tell some people, cause writing isn't comfortable for everyone. Um, it's okay to speak um, and then have a, some kind of a transcription. Um, yeah, because sometimes that's easier too, as long as you aren't mumbling. <laughs> well, as long as you're not waking your partner up either. So that, true. that's, yeah, true, that, true. those are the trade offs. So, yeah, I would, and, and oh, I just mentioned uh, I've been doing a lot of work with the, with the chakras uh, on EFT, particularly the lower four chakras, which mm -hmm. is where a, a lot of the, uh, the healing action occurs. And I've also discovered that some people are going to have dreams related to the specific chakra they're dealing with. So, if yeah. you're in the first chakra, you're dealing with fear, autoimmune disease. Uh, uh, a lot of people have dreams about self-defense because that's what the, auto, the immune system is doing. And then the second chakra is, is about anger and, and pain. And mm -hmm. so my, my patient with chronic pain are going to have angry dreams, you know. And then mm -hmm. the third chakra is about shame and eating disorders. And uh, I've had a, one, one uh, person who had dreams about sugary sweet things when she was pre-diabetic and didn't know it. You know? Oh. So that, and, and, then, uh, and, and then for grief... At the fourth chakra, which is lung and heart and sinus conditions, um, that's a great opportunity to have an after-death communication. Which, you know, when you when the person who died that you're grieving comes back and visits you, and there are ways to using um, uh, EMDR, which I'm not trained in because I'm not a mental health professional, but there's induced after-death communications can be done by Alan Botkin's uh, art, um, uh, book about that. But I've also been able to, to do it with EFT and just basically asking people who are grieving, we're tapping through the loss. And then if the person were to show up here, what would they say? And, and mm -hmm. they can have that sort of like an induced after death communication, which is wonderful. So. Yep. Yep. I've done the same, but without any kind of energy work, just bring them in. 
Yeah. Let's just imagine that they are here and then like the atmosphere of the room changes. Yep. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and that was my, oh, by the way, that was my second band TED talk was on, uh, I did a talk on spiritual alphabet, super death and dying about uh, NDEs, near death experiences, after death communication, ADCs, SDEs, shared death experience. And also, um, um, uh, what was the last one? Oh, um, the, um, after, uh, do, 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 near death. oh, nearing death awareness is the last one, NDA. And, and both of those band TED Talks are on my website. That's the only place you can find them. So look at <laughs> LarryBurke.com or, or LetMagicHappen.com. You can watch my TED Talks. So. Well, maybe we'll have a follow-up interview about that topic because that is really cool too. Yeah. Oh, this has been such a delight spending time with you. Thank you for your generous gifts that you always share. You're always so open and um, full of information and enthusiasm. Your, your bright light just shines out from you when you're speaking. And um, so thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Lori. And, and we clearly share that our mutual interest in medical intuition. And yes. I just finished reading Wendy Coulter's book. So that's Oh, yeah. She cool. has great work. Yeah. Excellent. Yep. Glad to see you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for today's podcast. If you want to learn more, you can visit my website for podcasts and resources at hopshealingtips.com. You can also like, share, and subscribe to this channel. This podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and is not providing health care advice. Please seek guidance from your professional healthcare team should you need assistance.